My name is Alexander Jordan, and welcome to another interview by Room for Discussion. We are deeply saddened we cannot be at our usual home on stage at the UFA. But that has not stopped us, and we would like to thank UFA Radio for hosting us. We at Room for Discussion remain deeply committed to, to t providing a platform to show students different debates and opinions, something that is especially important in these very strange times. So please, on this Facebook Live, leave your comments and we'll try to get them as part of our interview. But today, joining us via the ever-innovative Zoom is Professor Arna Bose. He is one of Holland's most prominent economists, a professor of corporate finance and financial markets here at the UFA, chairman of the European Finance Association, member of Financial Economists Roundtable, and former chairman of the Bank Council of the Dutch Central Bank. More recently, he is the initiator of a letter to the Dutch cabinet signed by now more than 100 prominent economists, including professors and bankers, criticizing the Dutch cabinet due to their rigid stance during the EU negotiations in providing financial aid to southern European countries. We couldn't think of anyone better to have on to help us understand everything that is going on. Thank you, for P Professor Votes, for being with us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So maybe interesting for our listeners is that uh, Room for Discussion was founded in um, October 2008, so right uh, in the middle of sort of the, the last financial crisis. And it was our goal at the time to um, help explain to students what was going on because things were happening at a very fast pace. And I actually dug back into the archives and I found that um, on October 6th, um, we had you as our very first guest uh, of Room for Discussion. So now 12 years later, um, are we having a little bit of uh, deja vu? Is it, yeah, feel the it, same? It, it, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like. And actually, I remember, um, I remember um, 2008 very well, and also room for discussion, uh, because Maris Kruithoff uh, was one of the maybe the Founder, initiator. Yeah. Uh, he came in my he came into my room the days before, and he said we need to have a discussion forum, and that's how we decided uh, at that to have it, and uh, and uh, it was from the immediate start a very big success. Um, and it has remained a big success over the last uh, 12 years, even at moments that it was not a big crisis. But now we are back at a big crisis. So uh, this is indeed deja vu. Uh, yeah. Crucial that the room for discussion exists. And, and so the feeling at this moment, how does it compare to, let's say, September, October of 2008? So I was very young, but for someone now being on this platform again, how does, it, how does the feeling compare? Yeah, it is. The, f the feeling is different. Huh? It's different in the, in, in the following sense. It's uh, my life was. Um, it has some similarities in my life, meaning the the explanations, the everything that you need to explain, what is going on. You see immediately the same backlash on yourself that you have to explain everywhere what's going on. Yeah. So on Sunday I was on national television on Tuesday night explaining what's going on. And that was identical in 2008. Every day had to explain what was going on. The feeling was different in one, basically in one way. Um, it was the financial crisis in 2008. And 2008, um, it, actually the feeling, it was a very desperate feeling in a sense because the financial sector, it was as if, as if every foundation had fallen away. We did not know whether we could stabilize the financial sector. We didn't know what was going to happen the next day. Every day, some other institute, financial institution was in trouble, and we had no idea how to stabilize the financial sector. So in that sense, the level of uncertainty, unpredictability, might have been even worse than today. Because today, we have enormous unpredictability, which is the virus, the coronavirus, how we are dealing with this coronavirus. It affects our everyday life enormously, everyday life probably more than 2008, because 2008 everything was open, and now we cannot just walk on the street. Uh, we have to be careful all kinds, of, all kinds of ways. But we know it is this virus, and once we control it, or once we find a way to live around it, we are fine. At least we are fine, we can, we can proceed. Yeah, so, you... so there isn't. So it's almost like in 2008, there were there was an unknown unknown. We had no idea what would happen tomorrow. It is more now. It's a known unknown. We know what the unknown is, and we know what we have to control. 
and we know that we don't know when we can control it. So in that sense, it, the, the, in that sense, the problems of society are definitely not less, but the level of unpredictability, the level of uncertainty, for me, is lower today than it was in 2008. And what's worse, because you mentioned sort of the two differences is one that it, it there seems to be an end with the virus that you, or a level of uncertainty that didn't exist previously. But what is different is the fact that now everything is shut down. So if you look at sort right. of recently the the retail sales numbers came out and the number of benefits claims came out, and those were dramatically worse than the 2008 uh, crisis. So how do those two things compare, the uncertainty versus sort of the shutdown effect. Yeah, so if you look at the macroeconomic numbers, uh, unemployment, the, 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 the expectation of GDP growth uh, this year and next year, you see much more dramatic numbers now than you see in 2008. Yeah. And the IMF, day before yesterday, came out uh, project, projection for this country, this year, GDP growth minus 7.5%. Uh, unheard of in history since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, so that looks desperate. However, if you just take one step back and you say, what we're doing actually now is we are more or less closing down part of the economy for part of the time. We don't know how the, what the length will, part of the time. And if you close down an economy for one month, let's assume you do totally close for one month, that's 8.3% of GDP if you close it down one, one month. So in that sense, getting to a number of minus 7.5% this year in terms of GDP growth is absolutely normal. It can be expected. You, you slow down, you close down the economy for one month, it's minus 8.3%. We don't close it down totally, but we close it for more than one month. So, so that number doesn't say much. If you stop today and you restart tomorrow, you're going to miss a particular percentage. Of your GDP. But that is not always the case, right? Because there are some things that are shutting down now that will not reopen. The businesses go out of sale, the entrepreneurs that lose business. So the, so the question, so the, indeed, so the question, the question is not, are we desperate because we're losing seven and a half percent this year? No, we shouldn't be desperate because if you close down the, bu the business for a while, you get to minus 7.5%. It's not norm like a normal recession or depression where the economy is in a terrible state. For one reason or another, the whole, the whole economy collapses. You have no idea on how to solve the economic problems like the depression of the, of the 30s. Uh, people had no idea how to restart the economy because the problems were massive, coming from everywhere, nobody knew. It was just a very bad government, bad economic situation, etc. If you look now, and if, we, if you would tell me that in seven months, we have totally solved how to deal with the virus, if we would know that today, in seven months, so it's, I'm not sure whether that's good or bad news, in seven months, we know how to, how to deal with the virus. We can make an economic plan, we are organized, and we get the ec economy restarted, and two years from now, and two years from now, we know we will all be fine. So do you think? So in that sense, so in, the, so, so in that sense, you can be a lot more optimistic today than if you compare it to these open-ended, open-ended economic problems. But what you are pointing at, what you are pointing at, if the period is long, and so far we have gotten a lot of bad news in the sense that the virus problem was first thought to be much more short-term than it is now. And actually, it might be reoccurring uh, next year. There might be new waves, etc. So the virus problem has become worse. Maybe our ability to deal with living with the virus has improved. But the longer it takes, the more businesses cannot be uh, kept up. So you have to accept at some point that some businesses think, for example, about the travel industry, think about, uh, think about restaurants, uh, that many of these businesses in a sense, we'll, if, the, if it lasts long, they'll close down. Yeah. But most of them, you know, that when the economy starts again, they will reopen. New owners uh, will not have lack of coffee uh, two years from now. There will be coffee, uh, coffee, real coffee stores. I'm not talking about the Amsterdam coffee shops. <laughs> the real coffee stores. We will, two years from now, even if, we, even if they all disappear today, two years from now, if the economy would reopen, we have coffee stores everywhere within two months. So, so, so you really have to worry about businesses where there is knowledge inside, where people, where one plus one is more than two. So not like ASML, one of the big the chip, yeah. chip uh, machine producers. 
if that business would fall apart, you cannot put it back together easily. So that would be a lasting damage. So the key, the key policy measure of the Dutch government has to be that wherever there are businesses where one plus one is more than two, knowledge intensive, particular types of collaboration, real solutions in a collaboration as a business, those businesses need to be accommodated because those can produce massive long-term damage if we let them go. Okay, and you mentioned the, the part about Europe now having a plan. Do you think European leadership is now better prepared than, let's say, what happened in 2008? No, yeah, I, uh, I, I was talking about a plan that if you tell me eight months from now the virus, we know what to do. We can make a plan, a national plan, and, and hopefully we are smart enough that we, uh, that we pull along and we, are, we, we show some solidarity with the rest of Europe because the internal market, let's just you look at for the moment from, from an economic perspective, uh, apart from the social issues, the internal market is very important for big businesses, even small businesses. Small businesses export an enormous amount to every other country in the European Union. So the internal market is crucial. So we have an interest in not just solving our own problems, but solving that problems in other countries get, get sorted out as well. So you can have a national plan. You can have a national plan how to get out of it, but make sure that you look at other countries, that you stand shoulder to shoulder, and that you make sure that all countries can take at least the minimum necessary measures to get over it. And, and that's basically the whole discussion of the last few weeks where the Dutch government uh, had a diplomatic, for sure, diplomatic failure. The way, uh, the way they um, had, the impression they had given, and they, they had done a lot more than just impression, but the impression they had given was totally the wrong impression because there is a common enemy today and the common, common enemy is this virus and this virus affects every European citizen, affects every country. And we need to stand together, stand together in fighting this common enemy. And that's not the moment to say that some countries, and the Dutch government is right, that some countries should have improved their public finances last year, the yeah. year before. Yes, they should have. But the common enemy is here today. So how do we deal with the common enemy? And how we, do we not confuse it with blaming these countries with something they should have done last year? Yeah, so that in the end, they did come now, the Dutch did agree to an agreement, and the, the EU works in that all countries had to agree. So Italy and Holland found an agreement, and that, that was signed last Friday with a, a $540 billion stimulus package. And it's a yeah. mix of different parts, so diff often different parts of uh, credit from different institutions. So you have the European Stability Mechanism, the European Investment Bank, but then you also have the Unemployment Insurance Scheme from the European Commission. So can you maybe, for the, for the help of our audience, run through the different parts and what they mean and what they do? Yeah, yeah, let me, let, let me do that. As a, as a start, um, if you think about uh, macroeconomic policy, and if you think about international macroeconomic policy, which is uh, the European Union, never think about one, 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 one lever, one, one, uh, one measure that you have to take. Always think about combinations of measures. There's never going to be a golden and silver bullet. Do this and you solve it. There are always many types of things you have to do simultaneously, and you have to hope that they reinforce each other. Yeah, so there's not macroeconomic policy is not like there is um, maybe like in physics, you can identify what has to be done and you get to a perfect solution. It's impossible. So you have to do different things. So um, so what the what the package of last week of the European Union evolved, and actually that package uh, was agreed. We, we can always complain that it should have been faster and that they should not have been fighting like crazy and that the Dutch should have been uh, shown much more constructive attitude. But glass half full, uh, the glass half full is that we're in a record time, record period of time, at least by European standards, yeah. a package came together. So if you if you look at if you look at that package, uh, one uh, one very one sensitive issue was centered around this uh, this uh, European stability mechanism ESM, which was a rescue fund that Europe had created following the uh, following the uh, the euro crisis, um, that that banking crisis euro crisis 
how to how to have a common rescue mechanism in order to in order to protect the economy of Europe. That was the idea of this uh, of this um, of this ESM, and the ESM uh, basically could support individual countries. But by supporting individual countries, these countries should have agreed to uh, restructuring measures of their own economy. Yeah. Restructuring Can you maybe measures. clarify those? Restructuring measures. There was a lot of discussion on what on restructuring the economy and that Italy has to get their books in order. Exactly. What, what does that practically mean for them? So, so uh, one of the key issues was that the uh, ESM, so this emergency uh, facility, was designed for a different situation as this corona crisis. It was designed for countries that got into trouble, needed to be rescued by Europe, and needed in, in return to clean up their, uh, their, uh, their fiscal affairs, basically. However, we're not talking about we're not talking about countries cleaning up their fiscal affairs. We are today talking about how to deal with the corona crisis and how to make sure that the different countries in Europe, whatever their shape is, can basically spend the money necessary on healthcare that's needed, on all the emergency measures and all the support measures surrounding this crisis. So the, the big debate was how can we use this ESM? without getting into this discussion of restructuring measures of the economy, which didn't have to do with the corona crisis, but had to do with their bad financial state and that these countries finally should clean up their act, that discussion we should push forward. So, uh, so the type of these conditions were removed because those conditions didn't apply to the, to the corona crisis. So what did the European uh, Union agree? That the ESM, this emergency fund, could be used by countries that needed it up to 2% of their GDP. So in the case of Italy, they could use 38 billion out of this fund, 2% yeah. of the GDP of Italy, 38 billion. And basically the only condition is it will be used on healthcare and healthcare related economic consequences. Now that's a very vague thing, uh, basically no conditions, no conditions, at least uh, the only condition, and that's, uh, I hope we also verify that, is that the money is being used for good purposes. Yeah. And what yeah, about when it gets uh, paid is, back? How does that work? When does when does now these are these are loans? These are loans, uh, and we will see that the other elements of the European package, because this is one of the three elements of the package, that all the three elements essentially are loans. So in the future they need to be paid back in the future, yeah. but they are provided under very favorable conditions. Also because the loans do not depend on the credit standing of Italy, but Europe is behind these loans. So the interest rate uh, is going to be extremely low. So very favorable conditions, except it has to be repaid. And Italy already has a national debt of 130% of GDP. And this country yeah. has 48% of GDP. So Italy is almost three times more. And this is all on top of the 130%. And that we are not yet talking about the fact that uh, Italy probably is not going to have a lot of tax revenue the next yeah. few years. So the, the 130 percent will go up anyway, even without this package. So will they so have the to? Really will they have to borrow from the from the ESM because they've said that they don't want to? Yeah. Uh, so so we are still t talking about this one third of the of, of the package. Since there was this debate the last few weeks, the, the, the nasty debate about whether Italy should restructure first before or, or promise to restructure uh, before they could use it, Italy uh, escalated in a sense its demands in a sense by saying, if you are doing, if you're making such a lot of fuss, we not, don't want it anymore. Yeah. And the only thing we want is uh, that Europe gives us money commonly guaranteed by Europe as a whole, as a whole euro bonds, which, is, which are a joint and several liability by every European nation. So we don't want the emergency fund anymore because the emergency fund is stigmatized. It suggests that we have done all kinds of things wrong because you try to impose all these conditions on us. So we don't want it anymore. So this was like an escalation of the debate. So once you get over the escalation of the debate, Everybody gets back to his room and uh, thinks over what's going on. People get back to their senses and they say, whatever instruments we have in Europe to help countries, let's use them. They are not stigmatizing, whatever. So Italy will undoubtedly, in the end, will use the favorable conditions of the ESM. So this was like an escalation. And will they then diplomatic be held accountable to those to the agreement part of reforming their economy? Because you say no, up to 2% they can loan from 
uh, for medical supplies, but anything above that, uh, they have they're required to reform. Now, one second. Now, the two percent is what the the two the thirty eight billion is in this piece the ESM this uh, this emergency uh, emergency facility that already existed. This is the maximum they get out of that facility. And that can be used not just for, for medical supplies. It can be used for any economic okay. consequences surrounding medical affairs. So it's very broad. It's, it's yeah. extremely broad. Um, so no, for the rest, no conditions attached. So it has nothing to do anymore with the restructuring requirements for which the fund was initially designed to be. That it was an emergency fund if countries had messed up. And if countries had messed up, they had to promise to clean up their act. So that's all off the table because the Corona crisis, you cannot blame Italy for the Corona crisis. Yeah. So, so this is a solidarity. We are willing to find, using the ESM, we are willing to finance 38 billion of the load of Italy. But keep in mind, it's not a gift. It's an, it, it's a Italy would have to formally repay it. So that's one element. Uh, so you can say, is this very important? Is this, was this important enough to have all these fights about? Uh, two percent of GDP. Uh, the problems of Italy will be bigger because look at the IMF projections two days ago. The projected uh, contraction of the economy of Italy is nine and a half percent this year. Nine and a half percent contraction. And is this two percent enough? No, of course it's not enough. But as already indicated, there are many uh, measures you have to take simultaneously. You should never look at a measure individually. And, and one of those being so the, the European had, Investment Bank. Just to move on to the second so, part. Yeah, so the package had two other elements. Uh, one is uh, the, one of the other two is the European Investment Bank, and the third one is the European Union. The European Union, in a sense, is the most interesting because the European Union is creating a fund. It's called SURE, S U R E, and this, the S U R E, SURE, if you would pronounce it, fund, is basically to facilitate labor time reduction, unemployment payments as a fund, as a solidarity fund in Europe. So you can, you can get money out of that fund to pay for, uh, for unemployment insurance, in a sense, labor time reduction, as a measure that we are taking in this country. Yeah? Corporations yeah. can apply uh, that the government takes over uh, large parts of, of the labor cost. So in a sense, it's a very social instrument because unemployment benefit is something we typically always national. associate with the, with the national level. And the European Union is now creating a fund that Italy could use for paying these expenses. So that's that's the second part. It's 100 billion. And that but comes from the budget comes, of the European Union. Now, formally, uh, formally, the 100 billion, um, and I have to be right, but the 100 billion is, is still involves uh, still involves uh, payments that uh, Italy would have. There are still repayments by Italy involved. Okay. So it's not just coming from the existing budget, uh, but, but we'll get to that. Uh, and the third piece is European Investment Bank. And the European Investment Bank comes up with loan facilities or credit guarantees for businesses across Europe. So it's in 200 billion, it's basically in 200 billion fund of loans that the European Investment Bank makes available for businesses across Europe. So not necessarily Italy, across Europe, but some countries need it more than other countries. So it's for sure an instrument, for sure an instrument for Italy as well. So that's how it is composed. Business related via the European Investment Bank, unemployment related via the European Union, the Sure Fund, and medical big economic consequences, 38 billion coming out of this emergency, existing ESM emergency fund that already existed. Yeah, so the, the other thing which is separate, which was announced in, in March, is the, the ECB bond buyback. So the ECB is committed to buying uh, 750 billion euros worth of government bonds through the outright monetary transaction program, so which will lower interest rates for countries in the Eurozone. So how do these efforts coordinate with the rescue package? Yeah, um, actually the 750 billion that, uh, and 750 billion buying of sovereign debt and on top of that another 250 billion buying of corporate debt yeah uh, those are formally so like the 750 billion buying of sovereign debt it's it, it's formally called the pandemic emergency purchase program yeah 
which is indeed what you already mentioned. It looks very much like this outright monetary transaction, OMT, but it is not the OMT. Okay. And, uh, but it is more or less the same. Uh, and why is it not the OMT? It comes a little bit back to the emergency fund of ESM. The ESM basically was designed to help individual countries that messed up, so not for this crisis. Okay. And those countries had to agree for, to all kinds of restructuring uh, promises of their economy and would subsequently be backed up by the OMT program of the ECB. So in that sense, the OMT was tainted as well, was tainted, stigmatizing okay, as so well. They're changing the rule so, books a little bit. So the ECB created a new facility, the Pandemic Emergency Pur Purchase Program, that sounds very nice. Who can be say yeah. that stigmatizing? It does the same. It does the same. And it has also the same role, because what is the role of the ECB? The, the, the real role in the end, the real role of the ECB is that a run on an individual country, for example, that people start doubting whether with the lower economic growth of Italy, their 100% debt that they have, and the new debt they're getting on top of it. If financial markets think Italy will never be able to pay this, and they start dumping, and they start dumping the bonds of Italy, yeah. It basically up. means that Italy is, and, and the euro area is immediately in trouble. What does this program do, this uh, pandemic emergency purchase program? It, it basically stands out as lender of last resort. They will always buy up Italian bonds if this happens. So, and if the markets know that the ECB will always buy up Italian bonds, we will not dump them because it doesn't help. The price will not drop because the, the ECB will buy them. So why would we drop them? Why would, why would we dump them? So the, the ultimate, the ECB plays this ultimate lender of last resort. And by being willing to play that role, market panic cannot occur in a sense, as long as it is credible that the ECB will do this. Yeah. So what I find interesting, which is with the ECB and the deal reached um, Friday, is that it seems to be two parts, which is one part that it's practical, that it's trying to put money in people's hands and giving money to businesses. But it, there also seems to be very much a psychological aspect, so a sort of test of unity for the EU and that credit markets react to that. So this yeah. second speculative part, when can we sort of expect to see if sort of markets call the bluff on is the ECB going to be a lender of last resort or things like that? Yeah. So for the speculative part, in a monetary union, you will always need the central bank. The central bank is the only party with unlimited resources that as long as we don't stop it, as long as we let it go, will always beat the speculators. Yeah. Because it can create money out of no nothing. Exactly. That's basically what's happening. So, so for the speculative part, you always need the central bank. However, and here's the critical thing, and that's also what you saw in the letter by the Dutch economist, the ECB, which operates clearly to the benefit of particular countries like Italy, would get into great trouble if it becomes a political institution. If, if the North says, oh, the, you know what the ECB is doing? The ECB is just financing Italy. And Italy, let's, let's put it to the extreme, can do with the money what it wants. It can, buy, uh, it can go on vacation the whole year. It can, go, uh, it, can, it can have a pension age of, uh, say, 52 years. They'll never work there, and the ECB will pay for Italy. If that discussion would materialize like this, the support that the ECB has would totally disappear. The European governments and the public would not accept it. The ECB, ECB would become powerless in the end because people don't accept it. So, so what is crucial? What is crucial is that this package of 500 billion, 540 billion, this package by the European leaders uh, that we talked about, uh, that, that we just talked about, in a sense, what the European leaders say, and the European leaders, and these were finance ministers, but still European leaders, they have to be accountable to national parliaments. They have to be accountable to, to their people. The ECB does not have to be accountable. The ECB is independent. Yeah. But the national leaders have to be accountable. So by being accountable and by, by telling the public, we collectively, as European leaders, stand ready for this package of 500 billion to help each other, they basically give legitimacy to the ECB, that, that their attitude is in line with what the ECB has to do. And if that's not in line, the ECB gets in trouble. Sooner or later, the public turns against the ECB. And, and the market will react to that. So 
how, how are we not seeing that somewhat? I think in the last few days, sort of the, uh, the Italy's 10-year yield is, is at a four-week high. So there is maybe a sense of the feeling that um, the ECB is not really getting that mandate or the unity in the European Union to tackle this issue collectively is not really happening. Do you think yeah, there is an, uh, there is um, there is uh, obviously the euro. If we had to decide today, had to decide today whether we would create an euro the way it has been created, we would never have done it. So the monetary union, the way it has been put together, was not a very good idea, in my opinion. Yeah, because sooner or later, as we have seen, not just today, but we have seen it with the uh, sovereign crisis a few years back, and also in the banking crisis. You see that it is very difficult uh, to keep the whole thing together, and uh, so uh, so there is an there is an uncertainty in the market, which has been muted, fortunately for now, muted, so it has been depressed, it has been pu pushed down. Uh, there is the discussion about the sustainability of the eurozone, will be with us for the years to come, and uh, so we will get into discussions after this crisis. Hopefully not before, because it doesn't help to have this discussion today. We will get in discussion. And it doesn't help to have populist leaders in different countries, because these populist leaders, what do they do? If, uh, if, uh, if they have a problem, they always try to blame Brussels. Uh, so so they, they try to create common enemies. It's a little bit like, a little bit like Trump in the US. Yeah. So you However, what's the big difference between Trump in the US yeah. and Europe? In the US, you have one central bank, one currency, and that currency is even the reserve currency of the world. So Trump can do whatever he or she he wants. The, the dollar will always be the dollar of the United States. Yeah. California will never choose to get out of the dollar. So, the, so this one-on-one -on -one support between central bank, currency, and being indispensable, the dollar is indispensable. Euro is the currency of 18 or 19 countries, and it, it's any one country is not a currency. It, in a sense, the currency is a foreign currency to every individual country. And in the US, the, in the US, the currency is one on one with the country. So we have an enormous friction in the Eurozone. And that has not been resolved. So it only works if there a, is a commitment to the European project. And I think that's something that led to yeah. your frustration, which was that you you wrote a letter and which signed by, I think, now over 100 economists. And so yeah. What I found was interesting that nearly every well-known econo economist in Holland signed it. So Zeta van Weinbergen, Baro Barsma, go on. And it was hard to find yeah. economists that maybe didn't. But what I find so interesting is that in some way you unanimously agree that we need to present solidarity. Uh, and you all in some capacity advise or communicate with the Dutch government. But why is that not seen back in how Rutte and Hoekstra maybe... Um, set themselves up in negotiations yeah so uh, so it was diplomatic for sure diplomatic so is, is that the difference between uh, a politician and an economist yeah not necessarily not necessarily yeah yes uh, we don't have to as economists we don't have to be uh, elected yeah uh, we don't want to become party leader uh, politicians always have to worry about uh, being re being uh, if they are in a party and prominent in the party, that their party wins the next election. So there is po politicians can never totally step out of that that attitude, even if they are even if they are prime minister. But I think uh, Rutte in general, and I think the Dutch cabinet in general. Let me let me be clear: the Dutch cabinet in general is providing extraordinary leadership to the country, in general. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, when you hear the press conferences, when you hear the measures, the the politics of it is very limited. So it was really a failure towards the, their European policy, where for one reason or another, they, uh, they either uh, got uh, tremendously frustrated maybe by the long meetings in the last 10 years. So Mark Rutte, because he was really starting this negative attitude towards, towards Europe, for 10 years he has been in all these European meetings. So he may have become skept skeptical about these very long meetings. So that may have clouded his judgment on how should I behave. Okay. And, and, and as a leader, that works immediately against you. In the case of Hoekstra, the, the Minister of Finance, if your Prime Minister already shows this, this level of uh, impatience to Europe and chooses the wrong tone, 
you have to be extremely careful. If you if you put a if you put a if you make a slight mistake, it amplifies this negative sentiment towards the Dutch already. And he made that mistake. But, but you mentioned that, that tone, doesn't... and I think that tone is maybe not what you say that clouded in his judgment, but it's also a tone that's reflected in the Dutch population. So if you if you look at some of the arguments, sort of if you scroll through the comments of things and you see that this constant reflection of the fact that Italy has a sort of inept political class that for years have been critical of the European project. The last Italian government rose pension ages, um, or sorry, lower pension ages from 67 to 62. It's been the idea of this sort of bon vivant uh, lifestyle of the Italians with lots of subsidies. Uh, And I think then they compare to Spain, which has been able to make significant economic and fiscal progress. This is idea that Italy is a, a lender that is not to be trusted and that we cannot give a carte blanche to to them and we should be requiring certain um, requirements from that. I think it's yeah. often so mentioned it, to it, the, the Calvinist yeah. nature of the Dutch. So is it not a political reflection of what the country thinks? But I think, uh, yes, and I think the population at large definitely has a point, definitely has a point. Italy has been irresponsible. Italy has been ir- ir- irresponsible. And, so, and, uh, and why so, not? so now the question. So now the question is, how can we deal with an acute issue today, compared to this structural issue, which is already going on? Uh, when did Berlusconi come in power? So how long is this already going on on in Italy? It, longer than yeah. maybe you have lived. <laughs> so, 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 so if you believe that you can solve the structural issue now in the middle of the corona crisis, you're totally, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about politicians, you're totally naive, it's never going to happen. And and if you ask Italy to do the right thing, they will, they may write down everything, we will do the right thing, we, uh, give us the 100 billion and we, we write down everything, you want a signature, here you have but a signature. Isn't that what the Dutch what is the value? What, but, but what's the value of that signature? We cannot, we cannot send an army to Italy if it doesn't behave. So you, you, you really have to think now in the corona crisis, uh, how can we stand shoulder to shoulder and at least try to get out of this friction, this period. And, and, and next, yes, immediately on the table is what to do with Italy in the longer term. And not just Italy, because unfortunately we have a few other uh, problems in, Euro- yeah. in the European Union as well, but Italy is a big country. So, so I'm totally sympathetic to, to Dutch people that say, we should not be, as Netherlands, be the lender of last resort of the rest of Europe. Everybody in the European Union should take his or her responsibility. I'm, I'm, I'm total agreement. So that's also why I don't want eurobonds, uh, because eurobonds, for sure, as a perception, means joint and several liability to each other. Yeah, but is the ESM totally not similar? Totally the perception. That's also huh? mutualized debt. The ESM, the European Stabilizing Mechanism. Absolutely true. But now let's take the other extreme. Uh, we don't we don't give Italy a package, yeah. Uh, Italy yeah. Or, or whatever uh, these countries. We don't come with a package. Italy is just borrowing from the ECB. Okay. It's borrowing via the banking system, Target Two. So in a monetary union, in a monetary union, uh, Italy has borrowed from the rest of Europe. It has, it has. I cannot change that. Okay. This is the only way. The only way we can change that. And so people that say we shouldn't, we shouldn't be sympathetic in, in terms of policy, yeah, in terms of policy now, those people basically have to sit together now and say, do we want to split up the Eurozone today? And if, if the answer of them is no, we should not split up the Eurozone today, then you have to come up with a package because if you don't come up with a package, all the money will flow via the ECB, it will still be our money. There's really no difference except that you have implicitly chosen to split up the European Union. You have implicitly chosen. I want them then to explicitly choose. And if I ask them explicitly, all of them say, no, no, that we should not do now because gee, what happens? Even Brexit, the people in the, in the UK want to delay Brexit. Uh, of course, you don't want to have in the middle of this Corona crisis, you're not going to deal with this issue that, that didn't come up yesterday, it came up 20 years ago already. So that has to be the attitude. And so do you blame the Dutch government for sort of increasing that sentiment? I think um, approval for the European project dropped under 30% in Italy this past week. So is the Dutch has had a role in that. And ha- Say it again. Say it again. So 
what, how do you feel towards Turkey the said? Dutch role in these negotiations? Because um, the popularity of the EU project dropped under 30% in Italy last week. So the EU project has become increasingly unpopular, and I think that also reflects back in sort of the market speculation on on the solidarity of the EU. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. That's also, the first, that's why this diplomatic failure is much more than just diplomatic failure. It's playing with fire. It is literally playing with fire. Because uh, all these sentiments among the population of Italy are one way or another carried over to financial markets. And it forces, in the end, the ECB to respond even more, unless you want to break up the Eurozone today. It forces the European Central Bank to respond more with our money, if you really want to think in, in, in those terms, because of this negative sentiment. So actually, you may, you, you, you dig in deeper hole by with this, with this diplomatic failure. In deeper hole, for sure. On the negative attitude of the Italians to the European Union today, let's be honest, uh, half a year ago, they were one of the biggest, the population was one of the biggest supporters of the European Union. So, so, so in that sense, uh, don't get carried away that the Italian population is anti-Europe. No, it is the political process that manages to inflict on, it, on their population uh, swings in mood by pointing at the common enemy in Brussels. But Italy itself, half a year ago, highly supportive the population for the European Union. Yeah, but discourse can change. We've seen it in the UK with the discussion around Brexit that political discourse does carry then on to public opinion. And That's true. Problems. So if you, if you ask me, should we ever do referendums, referendums, referenda, whatever yeah. the English uh, plural is, on the European Union or the Euro, of course we shouldn't do that. Because all these major decisions can be gamed depending on which moment you vote, depending on whether somebody is very good in anti-advertisement or pro-advertisement. The mood can swing. We know that from populations. Okay. We know that countries like Hungary are all behind their leader, while their leader is somewhat anti-democratic, to say it softly. So, so populations are extremely dangerous in their immediate voting. And I'm a full Democrat, but we shouldn't have popularity contest by the second. So if we want to have discussion on the Eurozone or the European Union, it should go via the political process of political parties. They should have it in their party benefits. It leads to discussions in the parliament over time, takes time. And it leads to different governments, and these governments might be pro or against the Euro or European Union, and ultimately may lead to a smaller European Union, which I don't hope, or it may lead to, to a re, uh, recomposition of the Eurozone, which is probably is likely in the future. But it should run via the parliamentary political process, political parties, discussions, and not a day-by-night uh, day vote. Let's vote today, and let's see what comes out of it. Yeah. So now looking forward, part of this um, the, um, package was an agreement to meet on the 23rd of April to discuss the reconstruction, sort of a, a new package. And to what degree do you think the sentiment that we saw in the previous, so this, this um, argument between sort of the Italians and the Dutch, continuing on into the reconstruction effort? And the, yeah, so the, so that's the uh, the thing that is announced. It was not part of the package. This uh, recovery fund, huh? they, yeah, they call it recovery fund, which is announced uh, in that package already, but was not part of the 540 billion. Yes, we will see uh, we will see discussions on that recovery fund because the recovery fund, uh, on the one hand, has a very noble uh, a very noble objective, given the massive uh, given the massive uh, destruction. That the virus caused in Europe, we need some collective recovery fund to help the economies uh, get over it. Yeah, so not just uh, trying to uh, trying to stabilize it, which the current packages do. You can call them stabilizing packages. Yeah. The current packages that it doesn't fall apart. But the recovery fund is to once things become more clear, what can we do to get out of it quicker? And then, obviously, there is some logic to it. Yeah, there's some logic yeah. to it. Let's make sure that, that if countries can come out of it faster, it's also in our interest, yeah? because the internal market, we sell things all over Europe. So even from our pure financial interest, it is important that, that a country doesn't uh, 
stay underwater for a very long period of time. So there is some common recovery fund that you can pay education, that you can maybe pay additional investments in roads, uh, whatever, or public transportation, whatever makes sense. But now you realize, now you realize how much and what do we put in this fund? And there are people, there are people that put everything that you can imagine in this fund. Yeah, I think and Timmermans mentioned can... about involving sort of the, the Green New Deal as part of this recovery fund. So... Yeah, so, and I, my attitude would be, it is obviously helpful that if whatever way we reconstruct Europe, that is somewhat in line with how we should live on this earth. Yeah, because yeah. before the Corona crisis, even in this country, we had all kinds of troubles because we had the CO2, CO2 emissions, all kinds of things were already killing basically our freedom to act, not just our, our, our climate, but also our freedom to act. So we know we have to do things along the climate dimension. So I would, so I, so the recovery fund that it takes into account how we deal with, uh, with these pressing issues is obviously a good idea. However, if you see the recovery fund now as a unique opportunity, since everybody is sitting at the table and let's use this uh, momentum, this momentum to put into it hundreds and hundreds of billions for all these marvelous ideas that Brussels has had for the long yeah. term, I say that's the one thing because the European people have not chosen Brussels as being the Washington of the United States of Europe. So how do you keep it targeted towards the recovery of the particular problem at hand? Because that is where there is support. There is no support for the United States of Europe. Okay, and do you think that going into these negotiations that Italy and the Netherlands, who were previously the most two that were far apart, there's a willingness to cooperate uh, going into the next phase? Because it seems to me if they're not, if they struggle to reach an agreement in sort of the midst of the crisis, now that coming towards, let's say, the tail end of the crisis um, or the, the virus problems, it will seem even harder to agree on some of these things. Yes, on paper, on paper, that's for sure true, yeah, because the, it's even less specific. Yeah? Recovery is less specific in a sense yeah. than dealing with the crisis that you see in front of you. Uh, so there I agree. However, you, what you will see now is we are not going to wait till the 23rd of April. There are going to be deals made between Germany and France, Germany and other countries, bilateral, in order to prepare this meeting on the 23rd. So okay. the Dutch have to be, stay out of the fire line, out of the uh, fire squad. Uh, they had, and that was also part of our letter. Eh? You, you, we told them, listen, it doesn't help to be in the middle, what you're doing. Stay out, stay out. Uh, look when you should use your firepower, when, you should, when your ships are needed. Be careful. You have to be relevant when the important decisions are being made. It was a stupid fight over this 500 billion. The Dutch didn't gain anything. That 500 billion package that we have seen would have been there more or less the same even if they had not fought it. Yeah. So they should have waited and they should have used their uh, potential influence on negotiations in the coming negotiation. That would have been more important. Now, given that they didn't do it, it's now important that Germany takes its responsibility, Finland, Austria, which are the traditional northern countries. And if they keep the Dutch at bay for the moment, or they take care of the Dutch, whatever way you want to formulate it, I think there will be a constructive attitude. Because I'm sure Germany and France, even Spain, is rather constructive in this crisis. Finland is not destructive. I'm sure they will come to an agreement. And as always in Europe, these are always compromises. And let's be honest, the Euro existence towards the future, so the permanent issues of Italy and other countries, they are still on the table, but they are not part of the recovery package. Okay, so last time leading up to the negotiations or during the negotiations, you wrote a letter to, to say what the Dutch should do. If you were to write one for the same, for the upcoming meetings, what would you want the Dutch government to sort of promote to be part of that package? I, first, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't write a letter. I, I, a public letter, which I did, I had never done in my life a public letter. And the only reason I wrote this public letter, and had it, and we had it published all over Europe and all kinds of newspapers, LPEs, uh, Italy, we had it published. Uh, so we had it published all over all over Europe. The reason I wrote the letter was that I knew, I, I just knew that the economics profession, in the broadest sense, would support the letter. So I wasn't, I would not create a division. 
because writing a letter to to be uh, to to divide society it's the last thing i wanted so i knew it would be unified and i knew also that by putting our letter out and by putting giving interviews and putting the letter in foreign media actually we would also do reputation damage control it has been damage control as well the dutch uh, the dutch uh, foreign service the employers organizations would not have dared to write a letter like that okay but and they, but they were very happy that we stood up so is it we stood up an apology on behalf of the up. dutch government in that sense yes i think if the dutch government thinks one step further than indeed maybe the uh, maybe the fact that they had to apologize to the dutch public that indeed they had done things wrong i don't think they like to they had liked to make that apologies. They're not very good at making yeah. apologies, but they did. If they think one step further, they will they will think we're happy that they did it. And and we did more. Eh? Uh, so now the next letter, you say the next one. If I write the next letter on the recovery fund, I cannot unite the economists in the way that I could have united them with the first letter. So it would have been a divisive letter. Okay. And I would never write a divisive letter because a divisive letter is not going to help the Dutch, nor is going to help the Europeans. Okay. So and now the question is why? Why is the divisive letter? Because because the 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 view of Europe, whether we can be a United States of Europe, or whether it's impossible and we have to get to readjustments of the eurozone, the view on eurobonds, whether eurobonds in the end are a good idea or are a terrible idea, their economists differ. Okay. They differ. They didn't differ. But that was they part of your differ. letter as well, right? The promotion of Corona bonds. No, uh, the letter. What the letter said was the primary. The primary mechanism should be via this ESM, this okay. emergency fund. What one could think of is, as long as we do not consider it mutualization of debt in Europe, as long as we don't consider mutualization of debt in Europe, we could think of crisis instruments, crisis instrument only dedicated to the crisis that collect mutualized debt portion. And that's the Corona bond. But, but now think about it. And why did I write that? Why was it added? It was not that because that was necessarily my desirable instrument. No, my desirable instrument was this EM, ESM, and let's stay away from Corona bonds. But if you and I, and you are another economist, if you say people will understand that this Corona bond is a temporary thing only for this crisis, nothing else, people will understand. I could not be against that. Only for this event, it's almost like the same as the emergency fund. The yeah. emergency fund is also only for the is only for for this event. I couldn't be against. It. But my attitude was: the Corona bonds will, for other people, they will read Euro bonds. They will say this They'll will see be it as a precedent. Situation. So I that type of discussion. So I would le have left it out. However, it would have I would have I would have half the economists behind me if I would have left it out. While their interpretation, like it's only for this crisis, if that would be the perception by everybody, I would not be against. So, so you see how I could collect every economist without getting in the discussion of, of permanent mutualization, of mutualization of existing debt, all these things out of the window. Okay, thank you very much. It's been very clarifying. And I think now rounding up the, the last part sort of that I'd like to ask you is that you speak to a lot of your colleagues in different countries, um, many fellow economists that you're in contact with. And when you are um, in this current circumstance, what are the things that worry you and what are the things that give you hope? When you speak to your colleagues, what is the those two things? Yeah, what uh, what definitely uh, worried me was that um, that by, uh, by being daily, uh, we are daily on video calls, with Italian, German, U.S. Uh, colleagues, uh, we have this. Uh, we we have this. Uh, uh, literally, this uh, these six people, uh, six people on a daily basis, where we communicate on on policy and and write. And we are currently writing the next policy letter. Um, and and those six people, we are in contact with all kinds of other people. Yeah, because the economist community is a worldwide community. And as an international economist, uh, on a daily basis, I talk to everybody. So, uh, so I, 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 met, I heard the sentiment coming out of all directions. 
and that uh, that was one of the reasons we came to I came to this letter. Yeah, uh, to uh, I knew there was something to repair. If I had been disconnected from the international community, I would not have. I do, would not have felt this, inter, this, this total misunderstanding of the Dutch as deeply as I could now feel it. So, so, so that was the biggest worry uh, I had to deal with, and I knew I had to act. Yeah, and, that's, uh, and I think, looking back, it, it's hard to, to have done it more successfully. It was very successful. Um, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm worried about the euro in the long term, because uh, okay. I always have been worried about it. We have national governments. We have national parliaments. European parliament is not in sight of the average European. We have all these populists in, in, in government all over the world. Uh, so we have all these divisive mechanisms all over the world and also within the European Union. For God's sake, how, how, is, that, how is that sustainable with a monetary union where the degrees of freedom are relatively limited? You have to stay close together in a monetary union. Uh, if it, the European Union, without monetary union, European Union, the internal market, we could have have different currencies with modern technology. It just doesn't make any difference. If you are a small business and you, and you export to France and you have to have a different currency, uh, this is automatic with modern. You, you don't need to have the same currency. So I didn't understand the urge to get to the same currency. And the symbolic value that people saw in it, now we have seen the symbolic value. It is rather divisive than it has been, than it has been uh, pulling us together. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it almost had, it had a different effect. So this is the, the biggest worry I have. How can we preserve the European Union, which stands for everything? And we didn't need the single currency for the European Union. And not even every country is a member of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the single currency. So how to preserve the European Union and how not to have the European Union messed up by the monetary union. So whatever is going to happen to the monetary union in the future, and I'm not, I have no idea how that will precisely go in the future. You can also be optimistic. Yeah, You can have negative scenarios, you can have positive scenarios. How do we make sure that the European Union stays together and supports each other? Because on the world stage, on the world stage, it's crucial that Europe has a voice, that Europe has a voice is crucial. We have had all kinds of wars in the last centuries, centuries within Europe. I never want to get into these strange type of debates about countries standing up against each other for, uh, for uh, uh, as if they can fight with each other. Uh, so, so in that sense, I'm very worried that the monetary union inflicts damage on the European Union, and the European Union, even without monetary union, has already a difficult time. Look at Brexit, yeah. and look at our eastern, our more eastern member countries, Poland and Hungary, where uh, where all kinds of things we stand for are uh, not taken for granted. So that's that's a worry, and the other more financial worry is. Uh, before this corona crisis and even not looking at the euro crisis uh, the financial system the financial system this money flowing over the world capital flows capital flows flowing from emerging countries back to the us if the us raises interest rates a little, little bit all the money flows back to the us all the emerging countries are in trouble again because the money flows out at the other moment the emerging countries are very popular all the money flows in all these this, these capital movements that we have in the modern financial system are unsustainable, are unsustainable. So how do we redesign the financial system that the financial system just by its own dynamics causes all kinds of damage on the real economies, on the real economy? We haven't solved that problem either. So, uh, so the Euro, the financial system, the European Union, so how we get along and how we get this unpredictability controlled, uh, those are my worries. And those things we have not solved. We need anchors. So we need really anchors. We cannot have everything being loose, like financial, like these capital flows. And the strange thing is, the last thing I say on this is, one of the four freedoms of the European Union, the internal market, was free flow of capital. Yeah. But the free flow of capital is also one of the reasons why the European Union, and even the Euro, particularly the Eurozone, had great difficulty. All the money flowing to the Netherlands and Germany when there was a problem in the South. It's the flowing of money, free capital movement sounded great. Let's not have any capital barriers, capital movement barriers. But we need some, we need some, we need some anchors. It cannot all be loose. Interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vogt, for your thoughts. I think they're 
as well. 12 years ago, you were a great help to Room for Discussion in helping explain what's going on. And now here, 12 years later, even though in both in uh, unhappy times, you've been a great help. And I'd like to thank you for being a fantastic guest. I'm afraid that we're now uh, sort of out of time. And um, I hope to um, hear you soon. Okay. Thank you. Hey, good luck. And uh, crucial, uh, debating is uh, the crucial thing. Universities should be the middle of uh, debates in society. And uh, you have done a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.